podcast today on knee pain, um, being personally affected by this, having sought out many different uh, many attempts to try to heal the, my knees after overexerting during uh, a kind of re-attempt at running again uh, with some headphones and jamming out and kind of hurt myself. And so um, it, it took about a year for me to figure out, maybe longer, because it was just this increasing pain. And, and so I went and got all these like x-rays and, and doctors and interface with a few different people and, and just couldn't get anything solved. And, and I never got really any clarity uh, from anyone on what they thought it was. I got some ideas from some doctors about needing surgery and it just seemed a little bit pre, like, um, what do you say? It seemed a little bit like um, I couldn't understand. I couldn't relate to what why I needed surgery yet, and so for some reason he couldn't explain that to me properly, and so I and I couldn't, you know, I wasn't able to hear him either. So that was perfect because I ended up not doing it, which is good because I'll explain why. And so I didn't end up doing all this, and so I ended up like just feeling like, you know, I don't know what I want to do. I just don't feel like I should go forward and. You know, and then right when that happened, I met this girl who spent 10 years not doing a knee surgery, and then she did it, and she had her mobility back and everything, and she was so happy about it, and she was like, don't be like me or whatever. So it was like perfect storm for me to go ahead and go with the surgery, but something told me not to do it, and that I didn't really trust the doctors. This was in France, too, and I'm not saying that, you know, but I just didn't trust the powers of observation of the person in front of me, and it didn't, and it wasn't convincing to why, and even the x-rays were inconclusive. There was nothing... So it was like, um, I don't know if I went so far as to get an MRI, which is, you know, a key part of that, um, but uh, I might have. Um, it's possible I did because I keep picturing me in that in that type of room, but I'd have to look back in that and see if it was an MRI or if it was something else. But um, anyway, um, I, uh, I ended up f f figuring out that a couple things were happening. The number one was the shoes. And so I realized that the shoes were causing the knee pain. And it took me a long time. And not only were they caused, well, it's not that they caused the initial thing, maybe, at least in my case, because there was an overexertion that I could trace. But it was what they did after that, as far as that overexertion and what that caused, that damage that was caused being able to heal properly. So what was not such a, what was probably a bad thing as far as the shoes goes became a really bad thing whenever injury was there and there was no way to recover. And so that was where, you know, it came in. And um, so um, so I, I went and um, I started researching shoes and I started, well, it took me a while and I just kind of like, I think, I don't know how I stumbled into it by accident, but um, did I order some sneakers or something like that? And I may have ordered like some boosts or something and I got, I started walking on them, I started to feel a little better. And then I started looking into European shoes, you know, like all these traditional shoemakers, they only make le these leather shoes they make their, they are, um, you know, leather sold, the, the men's shoes in Europe, a lot of them. And so now you have a lot of these rubber soles being put on these types of shoes. But in general, traditional shoemakers, even today, in Europe, copy and paste what they were taught, which is to not put rubber or anything on the heel or certain areas of the bottom of the shoe. Now, sometimes you'll see like a little bar or certain little things that have been well tested and they put that on the shoe so there's some grip, but like it's got to be in the right place at the right angle and not uh, blocking the supination is what I figured out later, the supination of the heel. So basically when you walk, your, your knees rotate. Okay. And so with that rotation, it, it, reverberates down into the, the the calf down to the heel and so that it comes out of the heel like this and so when the heel is blocked by a lot of grip like super grippy soles well it stays in the leg it stays in and never gets out so it comes back up to the knee and so that over time is creating more and more pain and the more you walk the more painful it is and the more you're already hurt the more painful it is too and you still can't figure it out you're just increasing pain but you can't figure it out but it's your shoes and so if, if you were to walk barefoot for a while, even if you take, oh, barefoot, you have no protection, you know, and some people do have knee problems, which are totally different than this, than my knee problem, which could be like a meniscus kind of cushion knee problem, um, which is funny because I also have that too. At least I had that energy in, in, in injury when I was younger. But so that type of problem, uh, which is not the same as this rotation thing, right? So this kind of meniscus like bounce, like, okay, you need some shoes that are soft so that way you don't absorb the concrete or 
whatever. And so, yeah, it has a lot to do with concrete, but at the same time, either one of those types of problems still are bettered by the right shoe. And so even if, you know, my brother one time, I was like, I tried to get that through, through his head one time because he, 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 could, he couldn't understand. He's like, oh, I got these really thick shoes. And I'm like, but they're grippy. He's like, yeah, but still, they're still soft and thick and I like them. And I keep having all these knee problems. I was like, I was like, I tried to tell him about the European shoes, like the boots and stuff like that. And he was like, no way, a boot like that's just touching the floor barely, like with the leather sole or whatever. And you're just like right there next to the floor. There's no cushion there. That's never going to work for me. That's ridiculous. But then he's, and then I helped him to understand, you yeah, know, it's not even that shoe, which is less comfy, um, actually may start to reduce. It won't reduce as much as the boosts will. And I'll explain that later, but it will reduce a lot the pain just because of the supination. The supination is happening. It's letting it come out. That energy is coming out of the shoe. That's why shoes have this type of angle cut on them. When you look at the back of a shoe, not sharp angle. I mean, you can have serious problems. There can be bow-legged, different things that create certain things. So I'm not saying it's just that. But in general, there is a little shave on one side or whatever. And so this is the supination happening over time. And then we get that. Um, so that allows it to come out. Regardless of the amount of cushion you have, it's still helpful, right? And so then on top of that, you can add those two features together, cushion plus supination, and then you're really getting somewhere. And so that's what the boost was doing for me because the boosts were so, the ultra boost that I had, they were such thick, I get the thickest soles ones I can find, you know, and and they're like all natural boost sole, not like one that's half boost, half, and I get the whole, and I get the biggest one. Sometimes they have really funky ones that look like moon boots. If you can find those, those are even better. Order like five pair and you'll be good for five years, 10 years. But like, um, and so these, this type of thing allows for the, the, the supination to come not outside the, well, out the heat, out through the heel, but into the boost. Cause the boost is like walking on a mattress. It has this strange kind of feel, but it's not like, it's, it's a well-designed shoe to, to give some active pushback, you know, when it's pushed on. So that's, that's important. You, you can't just put a mattress and make it work. It probably won't work. So they developed something interesting, right? So, um. And I don't know what their combination is, but to be honest with you, a lot of the active pushback comes from latex and rubbers and natural things. And a lot of the chemical, like um, petrochemical stuff, doesn't have the active pushback. You can't emulate what latex can do. Latex has this natural pushback, you know. So um, so maybe their boost is some combination of latex and petro and cloth and I don't know what they're doing but like they figured out something and you know like the old timers like the old school like if you go back to even ancient Greece I mean they were using cork right in the shoes and and sandals and stuff and so that cork was allowing for you know you could walk a, a long way on these things because of that cork so that's that natural sponge they still use cork in shoes I mean Birkenstocks included but but uh, what I don't like about Birkenstocks is somehow they've done something to the cork, like they poured something over it to make it like almost hard now. So it doesn't really give you that softness anymore because maybe they figured, you know, the, the shoe wouldn't last as long or actually they probably, um, they probably use it like the shoe would last as long if you were to cover just parts of it with the, whatever kind of epoxy that they're using or, or glue or whatever. But they, they cover all of it because they're lazy and they just want to you know, not um, have to deal with the shoe being uh, fragile in any way, um, which I can understand. But at the same time, they lose basically the reason that they made their market. I think the only reason Birkenstocks were even popular at any degree is because they followed natural law of this like old cork idea. So some of these ideas is what makes a business. And then they for forego it once they have their reputation sometimes. And then that's to the to the commercialization and just like it loses its soul and it becomes just like a hard shoe like everything else um with just a look you know it just the only thing left is the shell you know so i want you to sell your soul right <coughs> so um so yeah getting boost really helped me because it helped and, and it took about a year i mean it did take at least three or four months for me to even know it was the boost at first or at least a month before i started to go hmm what is this but so it was very hard to figure this stuff out. And then eventually I figured it out. And then and then the leather soles and then the fact that all traditional shoes were made this way. And I even talked to shoemakers after that. And they were like, oh, yeah, we never put this here. We always put an angle on it if we put it here because, you know, they can block the super. They'll even know some of the terms. He didn't say supination, but, but he knew that the heel had to have some looseness there. 
And um, because he'd been working in that tradition now, those traditions have been replaced in America. We just stick some soul on there and it's grippy and everybody's happy. And and you think you can just repeat, overcome this with maybe some insoles or something, which probably can help to a certain degree for certain things. But I've never seen them to do the, to have the same power as the boost as far as that absorption. I mean, concrete is very patient and it's going to win over us. And don't think that we've been doing this forever. We've only been walking around in shoes on concrete for a couple hundred years. You know, not even, um, maybe a hundred, you know, at a, at a larger degree, to a larger degree. And so, um, so this is new. And so it takes the body a while to realize that it's getting its ass kicked. And so um, try to find the right way to treat your knees and then you won't have to go through surgery and all these other things. Now, this could apply to a lot of other things in the body. Well, at least from the shoes on down to other things that we're doing in the body. And a lot of food plays into this too, how we eat. Like all these soy-fed foods and soy-based foods. I mean, everything you eat has soy in it. Every chicken you buy, 99% of chicken you buy in America has, has been fed 30 to 40% of its diet is soy. So how to get around that? Well, you got to find other ways and order from Amish farms and do more seafood and hit Asian and Ukrainian and Russian and Middle Eastern and other kind of markets and you got to start learning to get outside of that standard position that everyone's in because that's where we're getting in trouble like if you don't believe in darkness that's okay but if you do then you would know that if they were going to hurt anybody they would aim at that middle area right anybody who's going outside of that to a certain degree is going to be somewhat more safe because they're outside the calculation or whatever and that's also concerning air, water, and, and everything else that we put in our bodies, or you know, so we have to be smart in air filtration, and water filtration, and, and even glass water bottles if we if we don't have filters and stuff, and and even the filtering system, it's hard to get a good one. You know, you got to spend at least eight or nine grand to get an RO system for your whole house, and so if you haven't done that, then you're probably not in the right department. It's some plastic version made in China and and you're getting more BPA or whatever, BPS and stuff into your water. So do it the right way and spend the money. But so anyway, that I'm hoping they can help on some of the knee problems, um, just that specific issue. I also recommend transdermal magnesium locally. You apply it directly onto the, the area of the knee and you massage it in every day for three or four months and you allow that whole zone to become saturated with transdermal magnesium. And this allows for the body to have a better circulation in that area it's going to speed up some of the healing and it's going to allow you to put the things in place like i said before to get yourself out of harm's way while it's healing it's really powerful stuff and it also helps the magnesium levels in the body so it's still helping you on multiple levels from the nervous system to sleep to stress to better recovery and and better serotonin production and hormones and you know it's it's a key factor in all of that um especially if you get the right stuff there's a lot of cheap stuff out there most of the brands in america whether they're called ancient or permian or whatever you want to call them they don't they're self-certified claims a lot of it's coming from asia and then it's remarketed with the term zextein or whatever and the truth is is that the only time you can find true zextein products that actually come from the, that sea in holland that underground strata in Holland is from one place called the Zextein Inside, and that's their logo certification. So if it has the Zextein Inside logo on the bottle, um, then it's the right stuff. And typically it's in glass. So we always get glass bottles, blue glass bottles. We sell them at theheartoftradition.com. Uh, it's a marker of quality. Some people sell them a lot cheaper magnesium oil. Like you can get magnesium oil, it costs you $1.50 a week. This is $3 a week. It's double the price. But for $3 a week, because it's so concentrated, it doesn't cost a lot to do a lot. I mean, 50, 60 bucks a year, and you could knock this deficiency out. So don't go cheap on this one area, the biggest deficiency and the most ubiquitous mineral in the body. Try to get the right stuff, because if it's solvent extracted and imported, like I was telling you, then it's going to be void of its raw chelation powers and its raw uptake and conjugation powers that it needs at the cellular level for all the catalytic exchanges so you want to get the right stuff and the best stuff you can for this big deficiency anyway come check us out at the